Tonight on PM Express, our countdown to the NDC flag bearership contest is still on. And tonight, 13 candidates eyeing the NDC flag bearership slot. And we are going to be delving into the character of Guzi Tano, a man who, as you see, has a fascinating CV. A lawyer and a politician, founding member of the National Democratic Congress, was one time uh, the former president, Jerry John Rawlings' special assistant. He is a considered an ex-president Rawlings' darling boy, uh, to put it even uh, more flowery. Now, look at, look at what he's done. As far as his career is concerned, 1999 broke away from the NDC. And this is possibly the most controversial aspect about the man, Guzi Tano. Broke away from the party he helped found and then established his own organization, the National Reform Party. Why? Because he talks about issues surrounding corruption and disorganization within the NDC back in 1999. I remember that that era was just a year before a major election in 2000. Now, in 2000, he formed the Reform Party. He contested the elections. Well, he performed, say, terribly, 1.1% of the votes in 2000 elections. But that, many say, was enough to contribute to the eventual defeat of the NDC. Remember that in that election, Professor, the late Professor John Nevans at Tamils was the candidate. Many said Guzi really, really broke away from the NDC because he wasn't chosen to represent the NDC in that election. So he, he contributed to the defeat of the uh, NDC in 2000. But the man, well, returned. He now wants to lead the same party he once broke away from. And many said, 2000, you contributed to our defeat. Years on, he wants to help that party, he says, return to power. So we'll be interrogating that background, that very fascinating history. He's been saying a lot of controversial things in his campaign in the last few weeks. He says he wants an urgent cost correction for the NDC, um, he says. The party has strayed away from the uh, principles and values that he and former President Rawlings used to found the party. Um, he cautions delegates to reject bribes. He says he is not going to be given bribes and that that will be disrespecting um, the party. Listen, he says, describes Mohammed's comeback as a trial and error affair which will hurt the NDC. And many say, John Mahama is going to be one of the biggest, biggest threats to him. But can he be an equal threat to John Dramani Mahama? So tonight on PM Express, we'll be interrogating his background and what really qualifies him to lead this party, the NDC. And then he hopes eventually lead this country. We'll be interrogating that when we return from the break. Thank you very much, Mr. Gusitano, for Thank joining you. us on PM Express. Thank you very much. For How's the campaign? Me. Campaign is going well. Our message is uh, reson resonating with the grassroots, which is if, the core of our support base. And I believe that uh, we are moving forward steadily and surely. What's the message? What's the Gusitano message? Well, our, our position is very simply that the, the periods that our party, the National Democratic Congress has been strong, has been when it has lived up to and been faithful to the founding principles of the party, which are probity and accountability, social justice, development, and in the context of that, grassroots mobilization and grassroots participation decision making. So those are the cardinal principles of our party. And whenever we have been seen to be faithful to that, our party has been very strong. And it's our hope that we can restore those cherished values and move forward. I, I was, the words restore, we've been hearing it a lot, I think, since 2016, December 31st, if I'm not mistaken, when former President Rollins held a, just after the elections, I think, if I'm not mistaken, because I was there. Ah, uh -huh, yes, okay. Yes. At the Flagstaff House? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. 
And because prior to the election, he had promised that he would speak about what is going on in NDC, but yes. he wouldn't do it before the elections. And that was an opportunity. You were there. You were given an opportunity to speak at that event. Yes, I was invited to the event. Exactly. Yeah. I remember that day watching it, and a lot of my colleagues looking at it and says, this is the endorsement, the, the, the announcement of Guzitano as a potential flag. No, it had nothing to do with that. I've been invited several years to, to participate in the 31st December uh, revolutionary celebrations. You know, I was a cater in the revolution. But unfortunately, all those years I was traveling a lot. You know. So this particular year, I was available, and I made it clear that I would attend. It was just it a wasn't even. I, I didn't even know I was going to speak, as a matter of fact. It was just a coincidence. Yeah, it was a coincidence. Well, I'd been invited, so I was but going to go. But we predicted yeah. that day, I remember, holding a, there was a whole special show we did around that event. Yes. And we predicted that this, you could not just dismiss that event, that you were definitely going to enter the race at some point. And here we are today. You in the race? Well, I, I mean, you have to understand the genesis of my entering the race. Okay. All right. I mean, since um, we came back to the NDC in 2007, 2008, at the invitation of uh, Professor Mills to unite our forces to rebuild NDC, uh, because he acknowledged that the reform agenda uh, was a very important agenda, and it was important for us to come back together and rebuild the party, not just for electoral purposes, because these principles that I have described are so fundamental to the evolution and development of this country. So when we um, came in, we did a lot of work, political work at the grassroots from 2008 all the way down to 2016. And of course, through that work, we developed a network of organizations, uh, youth organizations, many of them uh, uh, activists in their communities. And about 11 of those organizations came to form what we call the Organizing for Ghana mm. a group as a progressive platform and group within the NDC to push uh, for NDC to adopt the true and genuine principles of social democracy uh, and begin to look at the key components of its program as a social democratic party, both in the economic sphere, in the social sphere, and also in the political sphere. So it was those groupings that began the call for my participation in the flag bearership race. And of course, I had said before many times that if I was called upon, then I'll see it as a matter of duty to respond. So this goes way back to 2008, you said? Well, the actual um, uh, uh, decision, uh, which was an organizational decision mm -hmm. by OFG, for me to participate in the flag bearership it was very recently uh, okay. at the conference in Dodua. Okay. All right. And even that, there was a lot of pressure for me to declare, but I hadn't done enough consultations personally with my family and others for me to make that commitment. You know. So it's not really um, something that I'm doing simply because of a personal ambition. Of course, I have a tremendous admission for my country, for Ghana. I believe that Ghana is operating at probably 5 to 10% of its actual capacity. Mm. And I believe that there are enough people in this country with, within NDC and outside NDC who have the talent, the knowledge, the skills, and most importantly, the commitment and dedication to, to spend their time fixing this country yeah. and making it work again and making it grow again for our young people, many of whom are unemployed, and also to begin to re-establish the integrity of our political institutions and our social institutions. You know, you know that in, over the last few years, there's been many problems with the judiciary in terms of uh, perceived corruption, with the political parties themselves, with uh, various branches of government. Every day there's a scandal here and there. If it's not MPP, it's NDC and so on. And I think that people tend to lose faith uh -huh. in the political institutions that were erected under the 1992 constitution. And it's important for us to steer away from the brink. Because once people lose faith in institutions, you think we are the, the brink? The, well, people have been predicting that. I mean, General Nguyen, Where, Mensa, where, where the brink is what exactly? If people begin to lose faith in the institutions that govern them, then they begin to go outside the system to look for solutions. Look at the spirit of violence we've had in the last few years. Every once in a while, you have a police station being ransacked by a community. I'm sure you know that. Yeah, we've seen people blocking roads. People blocking roads and so on and so forth. That is, is an expression of tremendous frustration with the order of things as they are. 
Look at what happened in tech just a few days ago. If you really go beneath the surface, it's really a function of governance and stakeholder engagement and stakeholder accountability and stakeholder consultation. Mm. You know, and, and, and once we, 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 we close the avenue for dialogue, then, and we close the avenue for people, people beginning to feel that they have a legitimate stake in whatever institution they belong to or they work with, then people go outside the system and these kinds of things emerge. But we don't want to see, and nobody wants to see that. Is another June 4th or even another 31st uprising. You Fortunately, think, you think the conditions currently. Well, I think that if that, you, that if, may if, if you have a, the if you have a political class that is seen, and I'm not spe speaking of any particular party, a political class that is seen to be more interested in itself in terms of its economic well-being and transforming its lifestyle to the neglect of the mass of the people. You're asking for, for trouble. JFK once said that if we do not, as societies, uh, cater for the weak, the imperative that befalls all of us is that none of us are secure. Mm. And I think it's important that we recognize that. Not only we're, our society. We're there with a political class today. Oh, we do have a political class. We do have a political class, both bureaucratic and. and I'm talking about political class, mm -hmm. as you say, that is more self serving than. Yeah, absolutely. Local. Is that what we have right now? Yes, we do. Your, we, do. we do. We do. Really? I mean, look at, look at the scandals as they come. Every government tries to create transactions so that they can, you know, uh, basically reward, if you like, their, their, their uh, supporters. Uh, create transactions so they can pay their political party debts, create transactions so they can enrich themselves, and that's not satisfactory. And I think that our concern is that as a party, our standards are much higher than any other parties. We were born out of struggle. We were born out of the grassroots struggle to be able to have a voice in this community that we call Ghana. And it's absolutely fundamental that we remain faithful to it. The only way you can remain faithful to the mass of the people is by living by the standards that we have basically mm. outlined for ourselves. The, the Jews, and to achieve the world. I mean, look, how can you have a society yeah. where about 30% of the population is functionally illiterate. Is illiterate? A society where about 25 to 27% of the children are stunted because of food. Where you have average class sizes around 60, 80 people. So that really the pedagogical experience in terms of learning experience is attenuated by the fact that there's not enough attention by a teacher to a pupil. Mm. There was a recent um, uh, assessment. It's called the Program for International Students Assessment, where they did, uh, it's an OECD related uh, program, mm. where they assessed 15 year olds from 76 countries in reading, comprehension, maths, and science. Ghana was last. So, really, we're in a context where because there are not enough resources going to our educational system, it's about only 6% of GDP, our children are completely disadvantaged in a global world that is completely competitive. They are not able to read and write, and some, some, many of employers say that they are not even employable. Mm. And that creates a hard core of structural unemployment that is a danger in itself by tomorrow. So we can't afford to dissipate public funds. The little public funds that we have, we must harness it and apply it by good housekeeping methods so that the city goes as far as possible. Today, as I'm speaking, Mr. Ofriata says that our expenditure is going to be $62 billion this year, 62 billion cities this yeah. year. The revenue that we're able to generate is about 51. So we have a deficit of 10.7 billion. We're borrowing to fill that gap. Exactly, but beyond that, if you go into the figures, 14.9 billion is being used to pay interest on debt. True. That's about $3 billion a year. Yeah, debts that Rollins took, debt that Mills took accumulated. all, exactly. Well, most of that debt actually had been wiped out because of HIPIC by 2009. Yeah. So it's, this is really legacy debts beginning from 2009 Post all the way two, to today. Yeah. All right. So you have a situation where the, 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 the resource availability, 30% of our export earnings is going to service debt. All right. 34, 30, 19 billion of that 62 billion is going for consumption. So the availability of monies to expand the economy by investment, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's uh, supporting uh, programs like NAPCO, JEDA, and so on and so forth, uh, uh, building roads, 
you know, it's constrained. Only 10% of that is for capital expenditure. Mm. Without capital formation, without expanding the economy, without creating and facilitating infrastructure that is available then to de-risk private sector investment, your ability to expand and grow and create jobs is, 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 is limited. So the little money you have, it must go so far. Mm. And it must be harnessed. And of course, naturally, if the international community, if the private sector, if the donor community believes and begins to believe that Ghana is basically doing and conducting good housekeeping practices, making every city that it ends go far, people will respond. Rwanda, yeah. is, they've responded to Rwanda. You, 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 they've responded to Ethiopia. Yeah, you, you talk about that and you... But some may tell you, you paint a very gloomy picture of where we are. It is of not, it is, it is, of where it, we is are. it is a picture and of gloom, but it's also a picture of hope yeah. to the extent that... Which I'm sure you say you represent, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that, I'll come to that. But you, you paint the gloomy picture and you, you want well, us... I'm not painting it, ask people on the street. Yeah, but you want us on you, the back You think that. that the violence in tech is simply an abstract, my, 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 my non question, event? My, my question is, you want us yes. that if we don't fix this, we are heading for trouble. We have to And fix you it. draw the June 4 example. Yes, yes. Some say, even the mention of June 4, it's such an unrealistic um, thing. For nothing, anybody to suggest... No, nothing is unrealistic. A, a few days ago, we were in, uh, in just about to give a speech. Then somebody said, oh, there's been a coup in Cameroon. I'm sure you heard that. But that's Ghana. This is... No, no, wait, 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 wait. It's so entrenched. Wait. Cameroon has had, a, has had a constitution for as long as we have had, but even longer. Yeah? The problem is that in any society, if the institutions of governance, if the arrangements for allocation of economic resource and the enjoyment of those economic resources by the mass of the people is not evenly distributed, and it's seen that only a small segment is holding everybody else to ransom. And indeed, part of that small segment is a political class that is thinking of only itself. It creates the conditions for instability. No, these, are, these are realities. It's a reality. Yeah. But, but June 4 is a military coup. Yeah, but, but that but, would not happen in 2018. But have you ever seen, have you ever seen a civilian uprising? Yeah, we've seen it elsewhere in the continent. Yes, exactly. But, so but, it's possible, but but let's not go there. And the important thing is that now let's let's the, talk. The, no, just yeah. the important thing is that we have the ability because of the very institutions mm. that are being deleg delegitimized yeah. to be able to to fix these issues. Yeah, but these issues are being fixed. Why? Because in what seen, way are they being fixed? We've seen free SHS. Just one. I just we've seen, I, we've I seen, just saw. I we've just seen, saw. We've seen free SHS. I, I just saw a policy that has been introduced to fix the I thing just, about I just saw. I just saw uh, uh, something about maritime authority and somebody mm -hmm. having blown all kinds of cash. Yeah, I mean we see this all the time in the auditor general. But that report. is the point. But but you made a fundamental. Point. That is the and point. If, if, if you, you we've seen this current government and the government that you criticised from the John Mahama administration introducing all these um, social policies to fix some of the challenges that you've identified. Currently, we are talking about free education. And what has happened to free education? Currently, we are talking about what, free education. What has happened under to free the free education? SHS policy? What Kids are in school. What has happened to free education? It's been implemented. What has happened to free education? It has been implemented. You have a situation where the funding and the financing of it was not fully thought out. Yeah, but it's been rolled out. Oh, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Part of the crisis, if you talk to people, is that almost all resources are now being put into the 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 the, the particular flagship policy of Which is the, a good of, thing, of the government. is it not? No, well, if you, if you deplete resources from other, other sectors that are directly productive and can grow, yeah. And you send it to this area. No, but it, means you, that, it means that you didn't plan very A few very minutes well. ago, you were talking about a, a few functional minutes, illiterates. Yes. How do you fix that? Make that a priority. Uh, starve other places and put it there. If that is your main concern, yeah, that's but, what we but, need to but do. But you have about between 48% between of children uh, from the ages of 15 to 24 who are completely unemployed. Those are realities. So you have to look at not only your free education, you have to have a comprehensive package. You have to look at your quality. I just told you about the PISA mm. results. You have to look at the curriculum de de development. You have to look at the infrastructure because the double intake, for instance, is a function of the in unavailability of infrastructure. The problems in tech are a function of the un unavailability of infrastructure. You have to have a comprehensive delivery program. Mm. You, don't, you just don't get up and start programs, right? They have started. It's a good program. We have to own it as a country and we must continue it. But we must plan efficiently and effectively and finance it. There's something called intergenerational financing. Mm. You finance it long term. 
that everybody bears a burden. Our generation bears a burden. Those who are benefiting from it bear the burden, and then you're progressing and you're moving. These, these things are serious things, because education is the key to trans a transformative economy in today's world. Yeah, that is why they are pumping all Look the at resources. Singapore. Into, yeah. Singapore yeah. It's, has nothing. But how can you, how, it, how do you oh, say that oh, and oh, just oh, say oh, we are putting Singapore, too much money from Singapore other places? Has no, 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 but if you talk to people, they say, look, if you talk to people on, on the quiet in government, they say, well, all the money is going to free education mm. and not, there's nothing for our sector. Yeah. Meanwhile, you must grow agriculture. Yeah. You must develop industry. You must establish the links between industry and agriculture to create value, to create jobs, to create savings, to create investment. Mm. Those are realities that you must, you must achieve. So even if the policy is great, you must plan it properly okay. and execute it seamlessly. Yeah. My That's guess, the reality. My guess is uh, Guzitano, live on the PM Express. When we return, we'll talk a bit more about the party he loves. By a party, he also broke away from in 1999. Stay with us here on the PM Express. Just live on PM Express. My guest is Guzitano. He is a, a contender to lead the NDC into the 2020 elections. He's hoping that later this year, the party will give him the nod to represent them. Uh, in those elections two years from now. But he has a long history working with the NDC, PNDC, Jerry Rollins, but also his curious relationship with John Mahama and Rollins. It's an interesting one that we need to interrogate. But let's start, Mr. Tano, by speaking about the party, the NDC. You talk about restoring those values. And when you speak like that, you sound so much like former President Rollins. Because each time I've heard him recently, he's talking about restoring the value. But the values you talk about, if the NDC currently isn't living these standards, then what is the NDC currently? Well, let me give you a history of the NDC. Right? The NDC actually came out of the PNDC political movement, the CDRs and so on, as a grassroots movement. And the idea was that because we're uh, looking for the broadest possible representation, the NDC will be an aggregation of different political interests. To, and that's why it's called a Congress. Congress. The, the PNDC component, the PP component that came from, particularly from Brian Harfo, the CPP component and so on, aggregated to form a political party to prosecute a particular agenda. That agenda was continuing the development create political institutions that are stable mm -hmm. under a new constitution which the PNDC ushered in, and also to achieve social justice and accountability in governance. Mm. NDC has not always lived up to that. In 96, if you notice, uh, during the elections, uh, our, as a social democratic party, it was quite uh, a paradox to see that our votes started falling off in urban areas which are the, the habit held by the working classes, which yeah. are normally uh, the constraints for a party like NDC. And indeed, we did discuss that and how best to, to improve that, that image of the NDC. And it has gone on. You know, NDC from a high in the, in the 90s, 92, over 58% of, of the electoral votes. It dropped to 57.6%, I think, in, in 96. We lost 2000, we lost 2004. Thanks in part to you? No, it was going to happen in spite of us. Uh, yeah. you, but you made yeah. it easier. No, we didn't. And also uh, in 2008 we won, but we mm. won by a, a hair's breadth, 47,000 mm. on the second round. And also in 2012 we won by less than 0.7%. Yeah. And then the disaster of 2012. And 2016. Yeah. So, so clearly, I mean, not all has been well with NDC, mm. all right, but it has even in its current situation, I, I am pretty confident when I say it's probably the largest party. It's also non-tribal. It does not have an ethnic agenda. And it also uh, has all social classes in Ghana, particularly the ordinary people of this country. And our view has always been, as a party, that the ordinary people of our party must have a voice. Uh -huh. And that the whole idea that you concentrate power to only a few learned people, you know, or a few powerful people, okay, and they only take decisions for a party, is wrong. Is that, what, is that what your party has become? Because there are tendencies in every political party. There's a bureaucratic tendency which believes that the party and the, and, 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 and the powers within the party are the ones who should decide things. So by, by 2016, the branch network, which is the foundation of NDC, based at the polling station level, have been completely neglected. Mm. So it, it, NDC's mobilizing power, its advertisement is in the community through the branches, mm. have been completely demobilized. 
So, of course, in that context, if you lose an election, it is not uh, surprising at all. Mm -hmm. So these are the things we want to restore. Because, you see, let me explain. The reason why I was giving the statistics about government expenditure and, uh -huh. and the need to uh -huh. let the city go uh -huh. far. As a country, we are not entirely in control of our own affairs. We are primary producers in a global economy where the prices that we earn for our, our goods are extremely volatile. Today they are one. Cocoa can be as high as £1,934 in, in, in the beginning of last year. Today is 1,634. It fell to 1,333. Gold was 1,317. Today is 1,231. Oil, which was at $85 per barrel just a few weeks ago, is now $76.65. You don't control that. Uh -huh. So the little that you have must go far. And not only that, because you don't have that much, you need the communities to be self-acting in terms of prosecuting a development agenda, uh -huh. especially in the context of a strengthened uh, what do you call it, uh, local government apparatus. So the whole idea is to empower the mass so that they themselves can begin to see how they can confront the development agenda that they have. For instance, you remember, when the electrification program started uh -huh. in the 90s with the uh, uh, connection of many communities to the grid, who bought the poles? It was the communities. They mobilized themselves and yeah. bought the poles. Self-electrification. Exactly. They, they buy the poles, they go to the electricity corporation or VRA, say, we're ready with the poles, we've done it, please connect us. And then you fix it. Within the framework of government's yeah. rollout plan. When GSS came, who built the schools? Who roofed the schools? Uh -huh. Apart from the support that government itself gave. So we have a history in this country of communities acting for themselves because there's not enough money. You can't wait for central government to do everything. To do everything. So the, the key is that if you, you, you have limited resources, you use it wise, wisely, mm. and you use it to incentivize and catalyze the community development mobilization. Because Ghana is made out of 39,000 communities. If they're all mobilizing at pace and developing at pace, then you mobilize Ghana and you develop Ghana. But if you have a situation where people think that everything is going to come from Flagstaff House, it's not going to work. Or, or, or the NDC headquarters. Or wherever, it's not going to work. Okay. Now, but you, you so, talk a lot. So the, the sense of NDC's grassroots mobilization accountability and grassroots decision making is a reality. Which is what you think in the your hardest times, uh, Evans, yeah. in the hardest times of this country, before a budget was read, yeah. because the NDC knew that some of the measures required by the Bretton Woods institutions, more often than not, especially in terms of cuts, of, cuts in public expenditure yeah. and attenuating all kinds of social programs, would impact mostly on the, the, the constituency of NDC in terms of being the, the ordinary working people mm -hmm. and farmers and so on. The party would engage the branches. They would engage through town hall meetings. Mm -hmm. This is what we want to do. This is the pain we're going to suffer. This is the triumph that we will all benefit from if we're able to follow this program. These are the realities of the global economy. Let's proceed. You may not get everybody's buy-in, but at least people know that they've been consulted. Mm -hmm. so, so you lost your connection with the grassroots. But yes, there's, a, there's, a, there's a word that you used repeatedly. The word is corruption. In fact, when, when, but what, when, why? Is it a new word for you? No, I'm in loss of the point. Your, 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 your TV and radio stations always. Yeah. Uh, I'm in loss of the point. When back in back in 1999, like when you when you broke away from the NDC, yes. One of the reasons you cited was that the party had become corrupt. No, I said there was a perception of corruption. Corruption. So, so in, in fact, the party, the analysis, and my, my question, in, in the analysis, my, my, my question to you is, yes, is the NDC in 2018 still so corrupt? Well, it's not in government, so really, it doesn't have access. Well, you to just, you just lost an election. Yes. And you have been campaigning in the last few days, mm -hmm. making a point about how, Evans, how Evans, people Evans, look Evans, at Evans, NDC Evans, executives Evans, and think they are corrupt. Evans, we is have, the party we still have, an executive We have a political system that inherently has a tendency to corrupt. Why? We don't have any clear rules, guidelines, enforcement mechanisms for party financing. Yesterday I was speaking at Adam, and I made the point that in my view, NDC has core supporters of about two million people, plus or minus. Those are people who would give to NDC. I thought that number is 5 million. No, no, that's, that's the vote. That's a vote. We're talking about core, oh, core, members. core support. Okay. Yeah, all right. If we could, on average, mm. collect a CD each from yeah. these 2 million people, that's 2 million CDs a week. Yeah. In a month, 
it's 8 million cities. In 12 months, it's 96 million cities. In four years, it's about almost 400 million cities. A party that is resourced is able to fund itself and does not need any kind of uh, uh, underhand dealing and, and taking from and corrupt transactional, sources uh, uh, so uh, to survive. Uh, uh, this whole create and share yeah. transactional culture that we have in governance in this country. And yeah. that's not peculiar to NDC. It's an entire, it's been, it's afflicted as no, well. But you have, said, you have said this week, Evans, your own words, Evans, that people see your members and they think they, they There's a perception. Yeah. But I've also made a point that perception is not enough. Until somebody is tried yeah. and basically determined by a court of law that they're corrupt, it still remains But you corruption. made those pronouncements on your campaign. It's a perception, absolutely. That people, the reason why you lost was that people it, saw it, your, yeah, your leaders they and they thought they were corrupt. It's a, it's a fact. It is a fact. Yeah. And people have made their people commentaries, still hold view of their commentaries on yesterday. that. Their commentaries on that, not yeah. from me, but from independent sources. Yeah. There are realities that we no, must But confront. what you say, sir. If, if you have a problem, yeah. you must confront it. It's the only way to confront and resolve a problem. Yeah. So if, the only way to resolve a problem is to confront it. But the, the leader of that, of that government is John Mahama, somebody you're going to go up against. Is he led the bunch you describe as people see them and perceive them as corrupt. Was he as guilty as a lot? You know, we were in Ho. Yeah. We were in Ho speaking to Tain. I wish I could show you the tape. Mm -hmm. And a young man came up and he said that, well, since the loss of NDC, there's been an attempt, they tried to do outreaches and so on. And, to, and people always accuse them of being corrupt. And I explained to him that, look, it is not peculiar to us. It's a, it's a political class problem, the elite. Mm -hmm. And that is something we have to overcome. And one way to overcome it is the party financing issue that I've discussed. Mm -hmm. We can go on and on about corruption. It's going to be with us. But the thing about corruption is that, look, when you see it, the instrumentalities and the law, the mechanisms and institutions that require to enforce those laws, if you see it, you enforce it. You, 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 you can never get rid of it. But the reason why Western societies, particularly the Nordic countries, have been, have been almost, almost, corrupt-free, not entirely, is that they enforce their laws. And, and every citizen believes in the need for integrity in public life. Mm -hmm. And every citizen has a voice. That's why having a voice is so important in our society, not only in NDC. To be able to challenge some of these things that, that unfortunately uh, dissipate our resources in a context where our people are hungry, mm. our people are unemployed. They go to hospital, they have an NHIS card, the, the, the public hospital tells them Public hospital they fund with their taxes tells that oh your NHIS card doesn't work here mm -hmm. you must go private. You, you understand? Mm -hmm. People are doing free exercises, but unfortunately some people also are collecting money under the table. It's, it's a systemic crisis we have, all right. And until we are able to confront that systemic crisis, we are going to continue having problems because look, if people predict the government budget is about 62 billion cities, if people predict that about 25 to 30 percent of that is leaks or goes to waste. Do you know how much that is? About 18 billion cities. Yeah, but I, want to, I want to talk about the part you, know you what, want to leave. Do you know what it means in terms of the number of schools lost? I, I get the point. The I, want, I, want to, lost. I want to talk about the party that you seek to lead. Because you think a lot of it's reform needs to happen. It's a it? great party. Of course. I'm, I'm, but I'm asking you... It has been very outstanding for this country and the republic. No problem. I, two, a couple of days ago, I was speaking to your other, uh, one other um, contender in the race, uh, Dr. Kospio Gabra, who says that John Dramani Mahama is a presumed front runner. You agree? I think the data coming out shows that he's a front runner, but marginally. It was much higher, I think, in May, even though he had not declared, but it's, it's dropping. Okay, yeah, and you, yeah. you, you just used the word credibility. Mm -hmm. Has he got it based on the leadership he offered, the party well, and the government he led? I, I, I cannot speak currently, but I do know that uh, as someone who was presented, and I say so respectfully because he's our former president, to the public, if you like, as a product, was rejected massively in 2016. So it's for NDC people to assess, think carefully about the choices that they make going forward to 2020. Because if you have a product that goes to market and is rejected, you know, and there's been historical examples of this. Jimmy Carter uh, went to market, he was rejected, term one, he steps aside, and so on. But everybody and, and their karma, what their karma mm -hmm. tells them. So I, I cannot say for now what uh, his, 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 the outlook would be for him. Yeah, but you can't say, but you expect the delegates to say emphatically. No, well, what I'm saying is that 
whatever lead he has has dropped. It has dropped significantly. How do you know that for sure? Oh, we have our own mechanisms. So Are you doing your own polling? We have our own mechanisms. Okay. We have, and we're very quiet people. We don't talk very much. Yeah, and I believe that uh, he is beatable within the context of the NDC primary. You, you're going to beat John Dramani Mahama. He's, let, let me just say, he's beatable. Simple as that. But yeah. you, you're confident you're going to beat John Dramani He Mahama. is beatable. I'm asking a direct question. He is beatable. He's beatable by a lot of people. He is beatable. And they are thirsty of you. He's coming from me. He's beatable. So you will beat him. He's beatable. If we, if we didn't think we were in the game to win, we wouldn't have tried at all. Yes, but it, my question is direct. And I'm saying that if we didn't... This is Guzetano if, saying if, you beat John Dramani Mahama. If we did not think we were in the game to win, we would not be here. One of the things you can accuse John Mahama of, and some may have leveled that accusation at you, is a loyalty. He's never broken away from the party you have. Well, I think that in life, you know, and I think Ghana needs more of this, we have to stand up for what we believe in. I think that our efforts to uh, point out the problems within NDC and to make NDC stronger, because NDC is so fundamental to the political processes of this country, especially because it's non-tribal and it's national. Our efforts have reaped results in terms of the ability now of branch members even to elect a presidential candidate. Some of those benefits of our struggle is what the NDC is seeing today in terms of its political processes. Mm -hmm. Now, the concern that led to uh, the breakaway were concerns that had their genesis from the early 90s. The problems with accountability, the problems with uh, grassroots participation, the problems with the fact that ordinary people must have a voice. For us to work as a society, to, for us to work as a party, ordinary people must be given a voice. And not only that, that voice must be respected. And we fought for that. Because we believe it's fundamental to the history of the NDC and how we came to be where we are today. Mm. And that is something that we sacrificed tremendously for. And Professor Mills recognized that. And he came to us and said, look, we agree with you. What you said, what you did, is something that we respect, we agree with you, come and help us to basically reintegrate and unite and build our party. And we did come back, you know, and, and we came do, back. Do you have happily. any regrets for breaking away? You know, Evans, when you're part of building something from scratch, to break, it's, it's a very painful experience. I don't really yeah. like to talk about it. It was tremendous pain. But that's why I asked about regret. Tremendous you know, anguish. Back. Tremendous anguish yeah. and tremendous pain. You know, and but I you still that, did. Uh, I'm asking whether you, you, you feel regret looking back on I it. I mean, you have to regret leaving something that you're very much part of at its birth. Yeah. It was very painful, but it was necessary to stand up for the principle that we believe in. And that principle has made the NDC a more open political party than it once was. It doesn't sound like it has, because all the things you told me right now, is like well, the I mean, party has lost all the things no, that you want to restore. Evans, you know, the yeah, reason why Evans, you broke Evans, away, Evans, you still point Evans, to them you today. Saw, you saw some of the struggles within MPP yes. before the election. Yes. Every party has tendencies. Mm. And as I was telling delegates yesterday, power abhors a vacuum. Mm. If you have a grassroots membership that has power to speak, to question, to lead, mm. and it does nothing about it, and it keeps quiet, somebody will take it. Mm -hmm. And there are people who believe that the concentration of power, especially in our context where they say people mm. are illiterate and so on, and they don't know they're left from right. There are people who believe that in NDC, mm. although we're social democrats, mm. that all these pe uh, people don't know they're left from right, and let's decide for them. And we said, no. It is fundamental to our creed that ordinary people must have a voice in this country. Mm -hmm. And that not only a few people decide how we go or where we go. Mm. and that they must have a voice. And that's what we fought for. And it's a constant struggle. It is a constant, because don't forget, one of the biggest crises for any political party, and that also exhibits the discipline of that political party, is that when you're in power, you begin to think that the state and the party are the same. The state and the party are not the same. Mm. They're separate entities. Yeah. And you must respect the party and the party's processes, and the party must be able to discipline uh, uh, its membership who are in the state apparatus. Mm. Because they're there on, be, as a, on the behest of the party, as ambassadors of the party, uh, basically governing Ghana, and governing Ghana for all Ghanaians, mm -hmm. not just for MPP for, or for yeah. NDC. Yeah. And it requires a certain discipline and a culture. And it's a constant struggle to get that discipline and culture in, inculcated deeply into our system. And it's go, always going to be a struggle. Mm. Politics is about struggle. Life is about struggle. So, yes, there are moments that we've lapsed, 
And our whole purpose as Organizing for Ghana in sponsoring my candidacy is to bring those valuable and cherished principles back to the fore as a compelling force for us as a party to be relevant to our communities and relevant to this country. You just said that it was very difficult, uh, but it was necessary. Which means that you haven't, you have no regrets. If you had opportunity, oh, to I mean, you, 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 Evans, you, 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 I don't, I don't talk. It's too painful. But you, see, but, and but, you have to remember, so Evans. You have to remember that also. You know, we came from a revolution. True. Whether you like it or not. True. And you were Mr. Rawlings' special assistant once we upon came from a time. Revolution and many people gave their lives for this revolution. Yeah. Many people lost everything. The people who were going to go to university. Mm -hmm. They dropped university and gave their life for this revolution. Yeah, you left a very So there's been a lot of sweat and pain yeah. to get the NDC to that point where it was able to usher in a constitution, usher in a new republic. And so and build a to violate or even begin to seem to violate the principles which are the foundation of our very essence, mm -hmm. all right, required that somebody stand up. Yeah. And I stood up. Because that, there was a lot of... Mm. Let, let, let me, let me, uh, Evans, you, let yes, me just give it. Yes. There was a lot of... Mm, what is going on so bad? Yeah. Some of us stood up because in life you must <laughs> you yeah. must have a view. For the delegates, I'm who, sure you're a historian. For the yes. I am sure you're. I a have read history. I'm a historian. I'm sure you know that many people have stood up against things that they love. True. In order to make that what they love no. strong. But you didn't stand up. You you left. No, we you stood turned up. Turned your back. No, we stood up. You you Completely. hit a brick wall. No. And then you, you no, left. Absolutely not. You we abandoned said, the we, ship. No, no. We said, let us do what we have to do for this party. You to formed win. a new political let party. Let us do what we have to do. And run against the, your party that you have found. Do, let us do what we have to do for the, our party to wake up. And indeed, the yeah. flag bearer Included who... Abandoned the, the flag ship. bearer who ostensibly was a cause of our damage is the very one who said, come. Yeah. This, what you said is completely true, completely valid, and we really need, we didn't handle it properly. You, you were, you, I just pointed at you, and we'll go for a break shortly. You, you, you were Mr. Rawlings. Today, you if were, branches have a voice, yeah. it's as a result of the way what you did. You, you were Mr. Rawlings' special assistant once upon a time. Is, is, are you his candidate in the race? No, I'm not. Absolutely not. He said, and I think we should respect that. Sorry, uh, your lights are a bit uh, yeah. heavy for me. No, he, um, he said, and I think we should respect that, that he's neutral and that he will basically uh, 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 work to assure for all of us a level playing field. But you are his darling boy, are you not? No, I mean, uh, we've had our many disagreements. Yes. You know, and, and, but we respect each other. And I believe, and I've said so many times, that I think he's been a very important contributive force mm. for the progress of this country. Was he a factor in your that. decision to run? Mm -hmm. Not at all. But he sought his blessing. No, every one of us, because the founder, to him. have gone to exactly. him and declared what we want to do. Yeah. And he said, well, I, I'm happy that people, 13 but of you are, he are will, doing he will this vote. thing. He will vote for you? I have no idea what he's going to do. You hope he will vote for you? I have no idea what he's going to do. I hope, hope, I hope everybody votes for me. But you hope Rawlings in I particular votes for you. I hope everybody votes for me. I get that. But you, you hope that I Rawlings hope everybody will vote for votes for me. But if you get Rawlings' vote, you don't mind. But we know it's a secret ballot. How would I know? No, but you don't hope that he votes for I you. Have, I have no knowledge of what he's going to do. Well, politics, and it's a secret ballot. Politics is a game that. of numbers. So You'll be wooing him to vote for you. Well, everything that we're doing in terms of messaging, in terms of practice, is to woo as many people, including Rawlings, to vote for us. Yes, so, so you want him to vote that. for you. That's all I'm asking. Everybody to So you would be us. happy if he did vote for you. But I wouldn't know. That's the point. But I'm saying it's a hope. It's an expression. So oh, I mean, all you're doing is this expression Evan, of faith. Are you an NDC? I will, if you're an NDC, I will hope you vote for me. <laughs> all right? Listening to PM Express here on the Joy News Channel. My name is Evans Mens. I'm here with Guzi Tano. Stay with us. I'll return more from the man who uh, talks a lot about uh, rebuilding from the ashes. We'll be interrogating his views on some of the current issues as well, here on PM Express. So live here on PM Express, my name is Evans Benson. My guest is still Guzi Tano. He is seeking to lead the NDC into the 2020 elections. And talking about leading the NDC into the 2020 elections, there's something I had when I spoke to one of the other contenders in this race, Sylvester Benson, that himself and yourself and four and three other candidates met and he told me on the same show that the thing that brought you together is that all of you are united in your desire to bring about change in the NDC. Well, I, I mean, none of them will be contesting if they didn't want change. So that's uh, logic, <laughs> yeah. logical. Well, what's, what's your own reason for joining the, the other four? There's, not, there's nothing to join. What basically happened was that the, apparently there had been 
this meeting is ongoing for some time. Okay. And uh, the concern was one, that all of us should work together to make sure that the campaign is not abusive mm -hmm. and is conducted in a cordial manner. Mm -hmm. Because should any of us lose, we will have to combine to work together to support the winner. Yeah. Well, should any of us win, we'd have to combine to, 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 to try and achieve a power change in mm. 2020. Mm. The second was that there were some constitutional amendments that one of the members was thinking about, and he wanted to pass it by uh, uh, some mm. of us mm. uh, in relation to the leadership of the party. You know that the NDC, when the NDC is in government, uh -huh. the leader of the party is the president. Yeah. And uh, some people think that because of that, it's created this, what I described earlier, this unfortunately unholy, the unholy measure of the state with the party. And that it was important to segregate that and have a chairman who is the leader of the party, whether we're in power or we're not in power. Mm. I think MPP has that formula also. So he was passing that out to us. So really, those were the issues. There was a third issue I don't, I don't quite remember. Mm. Why didn't you invite your mama? I have no idea. I didn't, I'm not the convener of the meeting, and I, I was invited and I went. Because I thought if this, you're doing five, you probably would do it. I really have no idea. Because these are very noble reasons. I, I, am, I am not the convener of the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had been informed about it about um, two, two, two weeks earlier. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was invited to come, and I happened to be free in town, so I went. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty unique because since you are contending, you are is going, you are going to contest with all the, these other four. No, I mean, you have to understand the that the that. grassroots of the party is very much aware of the potential schisms mm. within the party because of the issues and problems I've talked to you about. Mm. And there's a concern that because of the massiveness of our defeat, if there's disunity and any, any, any perception of disintegration, then we further undermine our chances of coming back to power in 2020. Mm. So as much as possible, we must do everything we can to present a united front. That is the, the desire and the passion of the party. And we're all, as candidates, trying to live up to that. Mm. Yeah. Although we have diverse views about how we can resolve uh, the issues within the party, how to make it stronger, how to make it more relevant to Ghanaians, how to make it credible and trustworthy so that Ghanaians will come back and vote for it in 2020. How is Nana Kufado's government, it's been almost two years, how, how are they performing in your view? I'm not sure they're doing very well. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, look, you know, I, I like to be very honest. Yeah, I mean, in in the context that we are in as a country, our situation is not easy. Whoever is in power, mm. so we have to be careful about. And and to the extent that we believe we'll be in power in 2020, we also have to be honest about the difficulties facing this country, mm. whether it's from a balance of payments point of view, whether it's from a macroeconomic point of view whether it's from the fact that we have vast unemployment and so on. And these are things that take time to solve. It's interesting you put it that oh, way. Oh, because oh, oh, say, can, I, can I finish? No problem. Yeah. Okay. You see, the problem with MPP, as I see it, is that they come up with all these good ideas and are failing completely in the implementation. Why do you say that? I mean, come on, look at... Look at Give me an example. Look, look at the way the, the, the free SHS has been handled. What is wrong with implementation of free SHS? Well, if you know, for instance, that you don't have the total infrastructure to absorb the increase in 32% increase in the number of graduates coming out from DSS who must go to. And you announce two months before people go to work that you're doing a double stream. There must be something wrong with you. Why? It means you're not planning. And because you're not planning, you're only able to execute efficiently. I mean, do you know how heartbreaking it is to see mothers trolling their kids to Black Star Square, checking where they are, they travel to Benkum, they travel, and, and it's just total chaos. You can't afford to do that with people's lives. What would you have done differently? Right. We would have planned it, executed it seamlessly, mobilized the resources, at least for the first two or three years, before we even touched it. But it's happened. We like the policy, we'll take it, but NDC will make it better. And NDC will finance it. We'll find the resources. How? We'll, as, as I told you, inter intergenerational financing. Long-term financing. You know, you know what? You know the MPP said the same one. You know it, it, it made it sound so easy Evans, Evans, that me. the funds were there. Evans, they got into the government and they Evans, realized that it Evans, wasn't as easy the money, as they thought. The, the money is there. You know, it's estimated that about 25 to 30% of our national budget leaks, wastes. Mm. They buy textbooks. You're sounding it's like MPP. That's what they said in opposition. 
it's, 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 they have uh, things in a warehouse. They have generators in a warehouse. Money is leaking. They inflate corruption. That is what MPP said in opposition. They that from the corruption and the yeah, leakage, they will save they, money to they, fund they, it. They, they said it, but unfortunately, they but didn't, you're repeating they what didn't, they, they said. Didn't, they didn't plan for it, and they didn't understand how these things work. All right. So you have to have mechanisms that block the leakages. That's, That's what your they first. said. Good housekeeping. You start first with good housekeeping. I've heard this all before. Yeah, we've heard it before, but it's, we, we all know what the problems are. The issue is the execution. Yeah, not say, the point I'm making to you, I'm not saying anything new to am, me right now. I, but everybody knows the problem. MPP the, the, said the same thing. We'll block the leakages, we'll save money from Evans, the corruption, and then we'll put it in the Evans, PSHS. Evans, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. Even the policies that we have there. Then there. why should I vote for you if you can't tell me because anything Because there are ways and means to be able to implement these things efficiently by planning. The resource planning. The type of human means you need to execute. My the question plan. to you: Why are you going to get the resources to fund this? You say you like it. You, why are you going to get it? First of all, you save on your budget. That's number one. Number two, you show to the world that you're serious. Like Rwanda, mm -hmm. take Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. You show to the world that you're serious about the little resources you have. You're managing it well. You're letting it go as far as it, you, it can, and you're managing your systems of delivery efficiently. And you've taken everything into account. Mm -hmm. People will come to you. If you want to fund education, for mm -hmm. instance, when we were going to do HFC, yeah. we took a $40 million loan from the World Bank for 40 years, mm -hmm. IDA. We can do the same for education. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the resource availability in the world and tap into it because it's tap. people have money. Mm -hmm. Governments have money, but they want to be sure that when they give you that money, because it's their taxpayers' money, mm -hmm. that it will go as far as it's supposed to and will not end up in your pocket. Mm -hmm. That's the key. So we have to have a plan. You see. NDC in 2020 we will not come and do this airy fairy stuff that, that governments do. We will plan every last detail. Of course, to the extent that, as I said, we do not control the conditions of our economic life because it's externally generated, we'll have to have contingencies that allow us to execute those plans in spite of those contingencies. You have to remember, this is a country where the seven-year development plan was premised of on a, yeah, a, a uh, I think it was a 500 pound or 265 pound, 265 pound uh, cocoa price. Mm. The cocoa price crashed completely. Yeah. So the resource availability for was not there. Yeah. Fortunately, today we have a more diversified export base. And we have oil. And, and if indeed we do the right things in terms of our economic intervention by supporting our private sector, by beginning to look at value addition for agriculture and creating the surpluses that allow for industry to, to, to be able to, to tap into that value addition, create jobs, create savings, create investment pools for the banks to be able to lend, then we have a harmonious, organized system of delivering an economy that works. Mm -hmm. And that creates jobs and that creates income. These are things you plan. You don't guess. You don't say in 2012, I want to do free education, and then you come to power and you have no preparation. Mm -hmm. You don't do that because basically you are responsible for people's lives. These kids, so we've got the quantity. We have the quantity. What happens to quality? What are you going to do with quality? How are you going to fix quality? Teacher education. Redo it completely so that it is responsive to the needs of our economy, functional. Teacher career, make teaching an incentive. When we were kids, you're too young. To be a teacher was like, hey, you were there. Mm -hmm. And don't forget that teachers in those days, as they are today, were fully committed. And the society recognize their commitment and pay them accordingly. Beyond the fact, we have to reform the whole uh, GA, GA system. Mm. It's top heavy, it's bureaucratic, and it's wasteful. Of the 6% we spend on GDP, a lot of it just goes to waste. Mm. The classroom teacher is the key because that's the direct interface between you and the child. You have class sizes of 80. My sister had to go and do uh, some Montessori training in one of these districts, I forgot. Mm. The class size, she came back horrified because she, she, she was in England. 80. Compare a class size of 80 to a class size of 15. The learning outcomes are obviously going to be very True. different. So you have to look at class size, and you have to look at infrastructure. An infrastructure that is wisely deployed in a cost-effective manner, not in an inflated manner, that goes as far as possible so we can begin to resolve the issues about classrooms, so you don't have double track. Mm. We can resolve the issue about increased teacher intake, quality, Increase teacher intake, mm. 
all right, that is able then to achieve this class size objective, all right, and also just consistent raising of money to fund. So you do away with double tracks, and not only that. That's only that. Let, yeah. let's, let's let's talk. You know, this is a society of different income groups. You can achieve free education. You can also do it in such a way By that you have a means test. So Evans, your income is X, Y, Z. The farmer's income on one and a half acres of land doing cassava or doing uh, what you call okro is X. Mm. Minus X yours. His kids go to school free. Your kids, you pay a certain contribution to the state or to the school. So the pool of funding is not only just from government, but we're all contributing as parents where we have the capacity. Yeah. So did I hear you suggest that you do away with a double track system? Eventually, because if you have, if you have the infrastructure, of course, naturally. Okay. Naturally, you do that. Because what, what, it, it's, it's the infrastructure in, in what, constraint that's compelled. Yeah. In what area will you give the NDC MPP credit? <laughs> Based on what the Again, so let's be honest, okay? So let me read you some stats quickly, okay? Then we'll go behind the stats. Mm -hmm. At the macro level, there's been some improvement. But I must say that that improvement started from 2016. That's John Mahama. Yes, it started from 2016. That's John Mahama. The it, man you're running against. Yes, 2016, but not deep enough. Yeah. So let's take inflation. All right. Inflation currently is about 9.6, 9.9%. Mm. Okay. 2017, MPP brought it down to 11.8. And when John Mahama was leaving, it was 15.4. So we have some improvement. Mm. The deficit That's was. That's an endorsement of John Mohammed's leadership. We have some, leadership, we have some leadership improvement. Abilities. No, on the MPP, we have some improvement on that. Okay. We have improvement in the deficit. The deficit was around 9.3%. Uh, mm. Okay, it's dropped to 5.9 in 2017 and probably will go further down. Okay. So there are interesting things happening at the macro level. And some of those interesting things have left, have led the international community to say, well, you're doing well, mm -hmm. at least you can pay your debt, so we're going to upgrade you from a B minus to a B. Because yeah. these guys, they're interested in whether you pay your, Absolutely. your debt, not because you're growing, okay? But you see, behind that, because I keep telling people that these wonderful figures we're seeing in MPP, we've seen them before. Kwesi achieved in 2011, our deficit was minus 2.6% of GDP. Mm -hmm. we, we've seen it, we've seen inflation sub 10, single digits. We've seen it before. You did say 2011. Yeah, 2011. Because of oil. Uh, well, uh, inflation, uh, inflation was um, in 2000. No, yeah, well, because of oil. Because, because of, of the, oil. Because of the, yeah. the injection. That's Where correct. the world's fastest growing economy. That's correct. That's, that's why I'm saying, let's look behind the figures. If you look at the, the growth rate in industry, they say 16.7. Yeah. But if you go behind it, most of that growth rate is because of oil, because yeah. of 10. True. Not because of any massive industrial expansion True. from one district. One factory. Yeah. It, it didn't but you must way. get the macro right and then eventually exactly. trickle it down, which but, is, which is no, what no, the MPP no, no, is no, 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 no. You have to understand that the macro is a function of the micro. Of the micro. So you think you're not if getting you don't the have micro supply, right? If you don't have supply of food, regular, available, cheap, the macro is going but to go But if what you said is true, how can they be getting the macro right and, well, and, it's, and not it's, fixing it, the micro? Immediately, you can do that immediately by your monetary and fiscal policy. You tax everybody to, yeah. to death and then you restrict money supply so that there's no expansion but in credit. But MPP's yeah. argument is, eventually, it will trickle down. No. It, now, it, what it, they wanted it, to it do was to out, you know, fix you know, the fundamental, Evans, which is what they've the done. The countries like Singapore, Malaysia, and so on, they didn't believe in trickle down. Mm. A free market is only a free market up to a point. The mm. market is a public good. You intervene in the market, it's even with your private sector, and build them up. We're doing... Mm. Uh, you want food, private food, sector food, intervention. Food for work and jobs. Mm. I've been asking myself, so what is it? Is it for us to become export oriented so we can create surpluses, for instance, in maize and export to the sub region once we achieve full self sufficiency? Is it a crop diversification program that we can use to export so we can get more foreign exchange so we can stabilize the city? What is it about? Mm. Or is it just to give jobs to the boys? You see, we're in a situation where everything must be structured in a way that we grow the economy and establish the linkages. Mm. It can't simply be slogans and it can't be simply job for boys. Okay. It has to be a real dynamic of growth and expansion. Let me ask and you. And it's possible to do that. Let me ask you. So, end of December, where do you see yourself? I see myself as a flag bearer of the great National Democratic Congress 
beginning to engage the Ghanaian people, to say, look, this party has brought you stability with many ups and downs since 1992 by ushering a constitution that has lasted longer than any other. It is a party that is truly national, not tribal. It's a party that believes that every Ghanaian must have a chance, must have equal access and equal opportunity. Most of all, it is a party that believes that every Ghanaian, no matter whether you're a sanitation worker, a farmer, a lawyer, a chief, you must have a voice. And that voice must count and must go far. And must be part of our development effort and strategy. Okay, you actually so come to us, work with us, partner with us to be able to develop Ghana and to be able to transform our economy and create the requisite wealth that is available. And you've been complaining quite everybody. vigorously. One of the things you've abhorred and said to the delegates to also abhor is people bribing them to vote. For I, I tell them directly. You say people, you should come there and give them 50. And so friendly, you know, one way in whole, some kind one of way in whole, I give you an example. One way yeah. in whole, speaking to Tain. Yeah. One guy came, I won't mention the region. And he said that um, he was completely astounded at one of the constituency congresses because the going rate was 2,500 cities. Candidates were giving 2,500 That's what cities. he said. It's on tape. 2,500 cities a, a delegate. And he said, well, look, I'm a son of a poor farmer. Does it mean that only people who have money and rich can be uh, officers of this party? Mm. I said, no. Uh, we, we have to join... At the presidential level, are people doing that? I'm not, we're, we're, we're not doing that. Okay. I'm not but aware. are others doing that? I have no idea. Okay. I, I will never do that. Yeah. That's yeah. Mr. Guzitano uh, speaking to us on the PM Express. Thank you very much for staying with us.